for coming to this talk today. I am Julian Kirk Doyle. I teach at the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam. Um, and this, this talk has evolved over time out of an experience I had as a student, very similar to Suzanne, you know, coming back from injury, you learn a lot, and now I want to share this so that hopefully others head off the problem I had, or if it happens to you, you know what to do in real time when it happens. So. Just a couple of things about what is the soft palate air leak. Some people, this, when, I, when it happened to me, I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea what it was. So the, the palate closes off the nasal passage so that when you're blowing air through the clarinet, it comes through your mouth only. When it becomes fatigued, like you see on the second arrow here, that it actually can collapse to the point that the air is coming out sometimes both your mouth and your nose or sometimes just your nose. Um, literally, the palate can't hold and this can happen a lot of things can cause it fatigue is it sets in and if it happens in performance sometimes you can recover sometimes you can't um, that's kind of the honest truth about it so when can this occur sometimes our breathing mechanism or air support is engaged properly we haven't planned out our breaths and i'll talk about that more later Playing posture can definitely be a factor in this, or playing posture can obviously, like dominoes, cause other fundamentals to not work, right? Um, incorrect embouchure. A tongue position inconsistency, you know, we want to really always keep our tongue position where it needs to be. Tension in your neck, throat, hands, anywhere in your body. Sudden increase in playing time, and this is when I see it the most with students, you know, they come back off of summer break, they haven't played, they've really ramped it up to do ensemble auditions or they're preparing for a recital and they've gone from like maybe 30 minutes of playing a day to three hours a day without working up and that can be a definite reason. All of the above in various combinations. Another reason can be following an oral or an abdominal surgery and I didn't include this in my slides but when I came back from having my daughter, I, after three weeks, was like, oh, I'm gonna play the third again. I put on my four strength read and I decided to play and my palate went Oh yeah, that's right. All these muscles need to be retrained. I have to, to recondition myself. And you should always consult a physician on that timeline of return to playing. And then start with it five minutes a day and increase by five minutes a day until you get to a good duration. Um, so one of the things I always say is if, if you feel fatigued, stop. Don't play through the pain. Similar to what uh, Dr. Chark was just talking about with our hands. It goes for everything. So a little bit about my experience with this. Um, it was my master's recital at Eastman, and there's a program. It wasn't short. On the last page of the Rigoletto Fantasy, the last page of the last piece of my recital, I palette went out. I have the recording, and I'm going to share it with you. You're going to relive my moment with me a couple of times. Um, so some of the things that the audience will hear when somebody is losing their palette, they'll lose power in the sound. It just seems like they can't get enough sound off the stage. They'll be taking a lot of frequent breaths because what's happening is the air will start going out the mouth and then it'll transition to your nose so you have to keep getting air so you can push it through your mouth. You'll hear <coughs> pops or snorts. That's, that's the palate bouncing against the back of your throat. You'll be breathing that shallow breath. You'll feel your embouchure even collapse and you can't maintain an embouchure. You, your head position might lower and sometimes even a lower head position, I'll talk about this later, will cause that palate. The performer may just stop. Um, so here is my moment. Hopefully, you can hear this. So you're seeing my inner monologue in the quotes and then in the brackets. So here, I don't know if you're going to hear the album.
audible. I talked to people in the audience after, and you could hear it out in the hall. Um, so what happened? That's all I'm thinking is what happened? I've never had this problem before. And then on that recital at that particular moment, it happened. We're going to listen to a portion of it again, and I've enhanced the audio a little bit so maybe you can hear the palette a little more. I know we've got some noise from the next room, so it's hard to hear. But from my perspective as a player, you saw a little bit of my, my inner monologue. Um, but I had heard the pops like that going on. It felt like I was blowing my nose. Like, you know when you blow your nose and you hear that But it wouldn't stop because I kept trying to press through. I can make it through the piece. I can do this. And I couldn't tell if I was getting sound out or not. Really, I had no idea. I just thought, okay, I'm going to press through and I'm just going to finish the piece and we'll see what happens. So I felt like I had a sore throat by the end of it because of that, that palate bouncing against the back of my throat. It feels like chlorine up your nose, and it felt like that for me for about a week afterwards. Um, when I went to play, I just I couldn't play for long. Um, while playing, I couldn't get a breath. I just could not do it. Um, I couldn't hold my embouchure. I couldn't support. My fingers were freezing. As you hear, the technique kind of was freezing up, and I felt the air coming out of my upper lip from my nose. So it felt like a failure. Here I'm finishing my master's degree, and I, I failed. That's literally how I felt. Um, so what did I do wrong in my preparation? So we're going to listen one more time just for a little portion of it and I've enhanced it hopefully so you can hear that, that palette again. Just the part where it goes. Inhale on a bow. 
you just automatically fill up, the throat is more open and relaxed. And so that's what we want to aim for. And then once you've done that inhale, set your belt for what you're going to do. And take that moment to set the embouchure and initiate the sound. Any improper fundamental support breathing embouchure can contribute to the, the, thing, the palate. And raising your shoulders when you're breathing, you know, any kind of shoulder tension. Um, so this is a diagram. Uh, one of my students who actually experienced soft palate pretty significantly when he came to me is also an artist. And so he's provided the illustrations for this. So you'll see these areas of pressure and puffing. I actually had a student come to me and he's like, yeah, my palate's playing. And I said, we'll play and we'll see what's going on. And literally, you could see it puffing out around his nose um, and upper lips. So the face color I mentioned. Um, and the breathing might become shallow and very frequent. So watching for those, those signs. I mentioned the shoes. Something about shoes. So three inch heels, you're putting 76% of your body weight on the balls of your feet. So if you think about that and how that puts your body out of balance, even a small heel. Uh, I, I will most likely play in a flat these days or in a soft sole shoe versus a harder sole shoe. And so I think it's really important, no matter what height of shoe you wear, to practice in those shoes for weeks coming into the performance, particularly for standing for that performance. Um, this is just a, a source of where I, I found this uh, diagram and everything. Um, wardrobe. We want to be mindful of what we wear in our performance. Avoid distractions. You don't want to be worrying about anything. Like if you're, you're up at a, I had a, a young lady in her recital, she wore a dress that was a little snug. And she said, well, I didn't want to breathe real deeply. I thought maybe I'd bust my dress. And her soft palate blew in her side. So we, we had to talk about, you know, well, we should buy our dresses maybe a size up. But, you know, another student of mine had a, a necktie on and it was a little tight on his throat, same kind of thing. And so we want to be sure our, our wardrobe allows us to be comfortable and get good breaths. So coming up with a plan, proactive prevention of this. Always warm up. No matter what, even if you played earlier in the day, take a few moments just to center yourself in your fundamentals and, and what, where you are for the day. If, if you've done any yoga, they always say, take your practice to where you are today. And we have to apply that on the planet. It's really important. Um, focus on good fundamentals every day. I had a student say to me once, gosh, I thought I was beyond fundamentals. And the truth is, we're never beyond fundamentals. We're always, we always need to focus on them. Just like athletes, they train just the way we do. Uh, work to eliminate any unwanted tension. Go slowly and efficiently, work yourself up to the tempo you want to play, but in the moment you feel tension creeping in, back off. We shouldn't play tense as much as we can avoid it. Keep your equipment in excellent working condition. I mentioned the leaks and things that's really, really important to be mindful of, and I'll more on that in a moment. Um, if you're doing a setup change, change your mouthpiece, read, try to the clarinet, be mindful that they do enhance what you do, and if you find a problem arises after that change, go back. And if the problem goes away, you have to figure out why that change made that happen. So it's really important. Always have a breathing plan. And again, I'll get into that a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, be mindful in the duration of your practice routines. Stop when you're fatigued. Really important. Just don't play through the pain. Um, and, and Dr. Turk was talking about this. When, when you're younger, you know, younger players, you don't want to talk about your injuries or they hurt. You know, because I want to do a good job. I want to impress people. But if you hurt, you've got to find a solution. You don't want to hurt when you play the instrument. So, a daily focus on fundamentals. I'm going to highlight some of the things I think about. Posture is so important. And one of the things, even if you're wearing, and I highly recommend neck straps, but don't let the neck strap pull you forward. You want to always bring the clarinet to you, even if you're using a strap. Have it tight enough wherever you need it to be so you can bring the clarinet to you versus coming to the clarinet. Coming to the clarinet causes a whole array of issues from, from neck, back, shoulders, hand position, air, eventually the palate goes. Um, sit tall and balanced, but be careful of overly straight. We have very, some very diligent students that sometimes over straighten their back and that can cause other issues too. Um, your feet should touch the floor comfortably while sitting. And again, I'll go back to my vertically challenged. Um, oftentimes, I'll go to the hall and my feet are dangling. And we have a really wonderful thing at, at my school. We have different height chairs. We have super short, short, medium, and tall. And so the stage crew always knows that if I'm sitting, I'm going to want a super short chair. If that's not an option, have something you can put under your feet, a platform or something like that. I, when I was in high school, the principal
principal flutist in the Tulsa Philharmonic was, I think she was about 410, and she would use a flute case under her feet. And one day one of the stagehands came out and measured her flute case and then built a platform for her feet and put, them, put that down there so that she could touch. And so it's so crucial even when sitting that we're balanced enough that we can, we can breathe properly. You should stand in a balanced way, just having everything aligned that you're not leaning anywhere that, that puts your air out of balance. Keeping your head neutral, one of the things I see with students a lot is they'll follow the music down the page with their head. And if you hear with my voice, my voice changes. We're cutting off our air a little bit. So being sure that we look with our eyes, not our head, very important. And stand height has a lot to do with that. You know, we want to keep our stand low enough we can see our audience. But at the same time, we don't want to do this. And if anybody has converted to tablet playing, I, when I converted to playing off of my iPad, I was using a small iPad at the time, and I found I was looking down on it. So I had to get a special stand that kept my iPad more at eye level. And so eventually I got the bigger iPad, and that, that did help with that. Again, use the next track. If it helps, use it. It's, it's really, really great. Um, breathing mechanics, we talked about the O inhale, but exhale before you begin, before you even take breath. Cleanse your lungs. Then you can get a nice, clean breath. And as much as you can throughout your playing, exhale when you have those opportunities. I like to exhale and, and put the end of the instrument in a, a tss or a shh syllable just to keep the air moving through. Um, again, exhale, exhaling that stale air after the long passages. Um, the breathing plan that I mentioned earlier. So what is a breathing plan? All plan, all of your breaths out so you're never shallow. We don't want to be shallow at the ends of phrases. We've all experienced that. We're like, oh, I can get it. I can make it. And, and why, why not end with a little air to spare? It's always nice to have a little bit on the, the back end of the phrase. So again, that exhale before inhale allows you to do that because you can get a much fuller breath. Um, be sure you're suspending the breath comfortably across the phrase. And I like to plan fail-safe breaths. So like, if there's something in my environment, I may be a little more nervous. I missed a breath, something distracted me, I get dry mouth. There's all these things that happen in performance. You want to have a, an extra breath there that just in case I, I can use this one instead of this tie or that place, that it will still work in the phrase and not throw you off in that performance. Breathe intentionally for what you're playing. Breathe appropriate to the dynamic character and phrasing. Um, be efficient using an open vowel allowing for that relaxed inhalation. Um, again, budgeting the air across the phrase. Let the air Govern your dynamic. Don't try to squeeze to play soft or loosen to play loud. You know, things like that. Just being sure that we're staying efficient with everything we do. So an example of a breathing plan, and this is a, a very minimal example, but um, this is Rose, one of the 32 studies. And I have sometimes students will come in and they can't make it to the downbeat of bar five without taking a breath. And we need to work on how they're budgeting their air, if that's the case. But what we'll do is see with that parentheses breath, that's what I call a fail-safe breath. So we'll put that in. Um, as an opportunity, or you could use the tied C in the next bar as another option. But then the goal is to teach them how to suspend the air across the phrase. And one of the things that I'll do is I'll have them actually practice with just the air. So, and that's too much air, what I just did for the front of that phrase. So I need to use a little bit more of a slower speed. And then I grow my phrase. So thinking about how we're utilizing our air, that we're not just blowing all the air at the front of the phrase and then squeezing to make the sound of So that's what can cause that palate fatigue. So stay mindful of tension. Keep your throat open and relaxed. I'm going to give you an exercise to try in a moment. Um, be sure your hands are working efficiently without tension, that your body position is efficient, and that you're not tense. If you feel any tension in your body, just take a moment, stop, and release it because that will really impact how you're playing. I see this in students a lot. Um, avoid manifesting the musical tension physically. We want to be the music, and that's fantastic, and we can move naturally. But be careful of, if it's really aggressive, that we don't get tense and aggressive, you know, that, that we want to portray that in a comfortable way, but without impeding our physicality towards the instrument. Again, allowing those physical movements to be fluid and natural. With your embouchure shape, keeping that vowel formation consistent, whatever you use. And I, I love to quote Larry Guy, the lips have the teeth, having just enough lower lip. Um, engage the upper lip. This was something that I didn't pay attention to enough in my earliest studies, that I didn't use this muscle as much as I should. So in using that whole embouchure, we take the pressure off trying to bite the lower lip, but we're giving that huge, really keeping that upper lip pushing down. 
with tongue position. Uh, Michael Lundstern has a great video. If you haven't seen it, where he talks about the tongue elevator, the of, ah, e, 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 and, and how to illustrate that for students, that there's four floors of tongue position, and we want to stay in kind of that E zone. Um, so that's a really nice analogy to use, and I, I like that E or U idea. For me, when I say E, the tip of my tongue is still on my lower teeth, and that's not really optimal for playing the clarinet, and it actually encourages anchor tonguing and all sorts of other things, which I did as a young student. So what I do is a shh, and that gets that tip of my tongue up where it needs to be. With articulation, be sure you're relaxed, especially if you're working on duration or speed and, and um, moving your, your our speed up. Keep your throat open. Make sure the tip of the tongue is moving and that your air propels the tongue behind that, that your air is always moving behind the articulation and not stopping between those motions. So this is an exercise I use. I'm going to talk through it, then I'll see if I can demonstrate it. But to, to show how it feels to have a more open throat and to also discover whether or not you're using throat tension to play the clarinet. Some players come to it and they go, Ugh, to play the clarinet. And that, that will blow the palate after a while. So play a full range scale, your favorite scale, slowly, and just see where you are that day. Then you'll finger a long B and have a friend plug your bell or you can do it on your calf. And then what you're gonna do is try to play the overtones, the partials of the clarinet. And then go back, play that scale again. Often you'll hear a difference in the sound. You'll feel more open in your throat, um, more easy to produce the sound, to send the sound through the instrument. And if the tone does open up, it feels easier, well, guess what? You're using some throat tension. And that can cause the palate to happen. So I'm going to try to do this. It's kind of hard to do standing up, but let's see if I can make it happen. Right? You're getting a little of the partials. And if you can do that, then go back and play again. You'll probably feel a different sensation. There. So it's something to go try on your own. I didn't have the whole room do it, but it's fun. <laughs> um, Equipment, see your repair technician regularly. Um, compromised fundamentals can be attributed to equipment deficiencies. Um, the leaking instrument, I mean, every six to 12 months, depending on how much you play, have your instrument looked at. Really, really important. Um, pads, just a small pinhole leak in a pad can cause this. Loose tenons, cracks through tone holes, bridge key alignment. Your mouthpiece and reed setup also, if it's a little resistant, you're gonna force and push too hard. Again, that kind of that throat tension. Um, if it's too free, we might bite or over muscle or tense our throat to center and get that beautiful tone that we want. Um, we want to aim for an effortless resistance in our reeds. A too hard a reed, we're gonna bite, and have a little bit too much back pressure, and maybe over effort versus too soft. We might, it's kind of like walking on eggshells. Gee, I hope I don't speak. Um, kind of idea. So we want to be sure we're not compromising what we do based on our equipment. So make sure your equipment enhances what you do and supports what you do. If you need a new mouthpiece, you know, sometimes with, I know with the Van Dorans, I tend to replace my Van Doren mouthpiece every three or four years, or I need to see somebody to service my mouthpiece. And that, that can be a cause of read issues and equipment issues, as well as having your instrument uh, check it out. One of the first places I go when a student comes to me with palate issues is the bridge key. Because if that bridge key is just ever so slightly off, you're going to have leaks up here in the instrument. And then it's not sealing, palate. And nine times out of 10, that's most of the problem, is some kind of leak. Then we do have to look at the student and the fundamentals of what's going on. But sometimes just an equipment deficiency can be the problem. So in your practice, your palate goes, how do we navigate it? First of all, stop and ask yourself the following questions, like the bridge key. How is my beat? Are there muscles in my lower abdomen? Are they engaged? Are they supporting? How are they doing? Is my embouchure working efficiently? Or am I biting? Am I tired? Am I bunching? Things like that. Is my tongue staying consistent where it needs to be? Am I tightening my throat or forcing the sound? Am I fighting my equipment? My reads, change reads. Always playing good reads. I had a classmate one time that says, oh, I'm saving my good reads for my lessons and, and performances. And they play on bad reads in rehearsals. And I'm like, why? Why not always play on a good read so you're always playing correctly and, and not having to fight? Um, is there over effort anywhere in my body? Am I physically more tired than usual? And that's something to tune into, you know? If you just gotten off a plane, you only slept for three hours and then you're running into rehearsal. Yeah, you're gonna play differently than if you've had a good night's sleep and you're hydrated and all of that. So be mindful of where you are physically that day. How is my posture? Um, in performance, if it happens. What do you do? Like, I wish I'd known this. 
when it would happen to me. Um, finish, if you want to finish the performance, you're going to have to pace yourself. But stay calm. You know what this is now. Unlike me, you know what this is. Check your instrument for leaks. You can take your clarinet and hold down the one and one and tap that closed pad right below your index finger. If that wobbles, your clarinet's leaking. Okay? You could also hold down a D and tap the rings on the bottom hand. If you feel a wobble underneath, your clarinet's probably leaking. So make sure that those things aren't happening. And you can do that in rests while you're playing. Okay, I'm all right. Or allowing you to adjust. So that's a quick one. Um, change to a softer read or pull the ring down the mouthpiece. Just, just ever so slightly because that'll make it a little bit softer because typically when the palate's fatigued, going to a softer read will help. Do some yoga breathing exercises, whether it's between pieces backstage or in rests. Just, just relax. Um, here's a really good one you all can try right now. So place the tip of your tongue where the gum line and the teeth meet in your top and drop the back of your tongue down and breathe. And you hopefully feel everything open up back here in, in your palate. This is a yoga breathing exercise. It's one of, one of those great, um, just sitting and you're doing yoga. Um, and one of my solutions when I had this happen in my graduate studies, I was taking a lot of yoga classes. And later that week, I was sitting in class and I'm like, oh, I need to do this breathing exercise. It really helped. Um, if any remaining works are um, there, cut the repeats if you can. If you just can't form an armature or anything, and the recycle. And it's horrible to do that. But would you rather injure yourself, or would you rather feel healthy? So I had a student that in one of her, her first degree recitals, her palate collapsed towards the end of the recital. She still had an entire Brahms sonata to play. And backstage, we did the breathing exercises, calmed her down. She was crying, my palate blew, what do I do? And so we talked through it, okay, it, you know, cut, cut this, cut that, you know, just, just don't do this repeat. And she made it through. But halfway through the Brahms, she realized she had a crack in her palate. So that was the other reason for it. So her second degree recital, she wanted to play all of Vapor two. She gets almost to the end of the first movement, palate goes. She looks at the audience and she says, I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you for waiting. She goes off stage, she had on three inches. She came back out, she changed her read, and she was in bare feet. So she, she took those precautions to make her way through the rest of the recital. Um, another student, her palate collapsed in the first part of the recital. She pulled her read down, made it through the rest of the program no problem. And this is just because I've talked about these things with them in lessons, and so they were proactive about it and knew what to do. Um, and it was a cabinet need was where her first blew. So, Back to kind of some solutions. Um, working with a vocalist is really helpful because they do a lot of talk about this pedagogy of the palate. Um, but some speech exercises they use, work. And we only want to do those for like three to five minutes a day. We don't want to do too much. Um, if your mouth is closed, you feel an inner smile. You can do these exercises while you're assembling your instrument, while you're putting your read on, you know. But don't do them too much. Two to three minutes a day, maybe five at most. Um, but working again with a vocal teacher, if you're having any issues with palate, is really, really helpful. Some breathing exercises, anything that um, you do in yoga or the breathing gym, if you're familiar with the breathing gym, Sam Palivian's work, really, really helpful. Um, but just continue to increase your awareness of breath efficiency while you're playing. Um, when I was recovering from this, I was doing a lot of running, and so I would actually focus on how I was breathing when I was running, and, and I would match my breathing to my pace. Like, four paces in, four paces out, or something like that. Just thinking about how I could better be in tune with my breathing. So, yes, they told, they told me it was okay. I could do that, thank you. Um, the clarinet is an extension of our body, so just remember that we want to stay balanced. Um, we want to keep our focus, our breathing focused. We want to take breaks in our practice. Stretch before and after you play to eliminate any unwanted one attention, but stretching is so important, especially those muscles that, that we maybe feel tight in the right hand, particularly if, if we're having any right hand pain. Um, seated or standing, it's, it's great to do both. Be consistent. Um, be sure, again, that the chair is the proper height. Um, please use an extra app if it helps you. Um, some days you may feel more inclined to sit than stand. That's okay. I had a recital in 2020, um, literally right before the world shut down, and I'm pretty sure I had COVID that week. I had some sort of really horrible respiratory thing. And right before I walked out on stage, I thought, you know, I think I'm gonna sit. And I asked the stage crew if they gave me a chair, and they said, yeah, sure. But I had planned to play the whole recital standing, and I'm sitting, sitting, I think I had much more success.
successful performance. So some things to do if you have palate issues, keep a journal, be mindful of all of these things that we've kind of covered today, asking those questions, um, appropriateness of air speed, you know, thinking about was it when I was running a long piece, was it after short duration, check your equipment, all of those things. If you're getting back in shape, um, after either a collapse, a surgery, anything, um, start with five minutes a day, increase by five minutes each day until you feel comfortable, take frequent breaks, um, move from like long tones to slow articulated passages and work up as your endurance allows. Um, but avoid playing through tension, pain, or discomfort. Instead, stop and rest. Um, keep awareness of all your fundamentals and while you're increasing this duration. Most important, listen to your body and be patient with your progress. We all want to get from point A to point Z, but sometimes we have to do all those letters between. So very, very important. So remember that you can overcome this. Um, the palate can be recovered, just like most injuries. You just have to be patient and work through it. Um, have a daily checklist that you check in with every day. Practice slowly with relaxation. And stop when you're fatigued. Stop when you're fatigued. Remember you're an athlete, just use smaller muscles. Train like So if there are any questions, I know we're just a hair over time, but I know the next presentation isn't here. So I'm happy to take some questions in the hallway if there's any in the chat. Um, but thank you all for coming to my talk today. Appreciate it.